Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. In my judgment, the Artemis program is excessively complex, unrealistically priced, compromises crew safety, poses very high mission risk of completion, and is highly unlikely to be completed in a timely manner, even if successful. For the United States and its partners to be on the moon when others are on the moon is unacceptable. We need a program that is consistent with that theme. Artemis is not that program. We need to restart it not keep it on track. Congress met yesterday, January 17th, to discuss the status of Artemis, and these are the kinds of things that were being said. Not very encouraging, but is Congress right about all of this, or rather, the witnesses that were testifying in front of Congress? Does Artemis need to be restarted? Is Artemis broken at all? And if it is, is there a way to fix it that's a little less extreme than canceling it? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So, apparently I'm not the only one who is dissatisfied with NASA's new timeline for Artemis. The delay, especially in regards to Artemis 2, really puts the whole timeline out considerably. And also, I don't think Congress is any more convinced than I am that Artemis 3 is actually going to realistically happen in 2000. 2026. Recently, Congress met about the topic and called a number of witnesses to testify about the state of Artemis and whether or not the program should even continue. In addition to that, China's current progress was discussed, and this is one of the biggest things that Congress is concerned about. In some ways, I think this is good news. The fact that Congress recognizes that China presents a very credible threat to the future of lunar exploration, that they want to essentially start grabbing real estate up there and to prevent anybody else from gaining the same strategic advantage that they could gain from establishing a permanent presence at the lunar south pole. But in addition to this concern, Congress seems to be unconvinced that Artemis is actually going to be able to get us to the moon before the Chinese plan to put human beings there in 2030 and to make matters even worse, they are even less convinced that NASA's current plans are going to keep us ahead of the Chinese through 2045, the date that China has stated they intend to overtake everybody else in the spaceflight industry and become the dominant space power on the planet. Not that long ago, NASA was ostensibly planning to put human beings here at Shackleton Crater at the Lunar South Pole by this year, 2024. Obviously, at this point, it's become very clear that that date was never realistic, and as we all know, the projected landing dates for astronauts on the moon utilizing SLS, the Orion capsule, and Lunar Starship continues to get pushed out and now currently sits at September of 2026. Now, of course, this is still several Several years ahead of when China plans to put their astronauts on the moon, or rather Taikonauts, but in a recent meeting for Congress and NASA officials together with witnesses from the space industry, including a previous NASA administrator, well, it appears that NASA's plans, and especially Artemis, are in serious jeopardy. And one of the biggest problems? Well, it's the fact that nobody in Congress really believes that September of 2020 is a realistic date to put astronauts back on the moon. I don't think the Artemis 3, the landing mission, is at all realistically scheduled. That was Mike Griffin, the co-president and co-founder of the consulting company Logic, who also served as NASA administrator from 2005 until 2009. And boy, he lied a lot of other things to say about Artemis, and none of it was particularly complimentary. But before we get to his statements, we should also talk about just how concerned Congress is about the threat of China. Quote, I remind my colleagues that we are not the only country interested in sending humans to the moon. That's according to Frank Lucas, representative from Oklahoma. 
the Chinese Communist Party is actively soliciting international partners for a lunar mission and has stated its ambition to have human astronauts on the surface by 2030. The country that lands first will have the ability to set a precedent for whether future lunar activities are conducted with openness and transparency or a more restricted manner. And this was a bipartisan concern. California Democrat Zoe Lofgren had this to say, quote, let me be clear, I support Artemis, but I want it to be successful, especially with China at our heels, and we want to be helpful here in the committee in assuring that Artemis is strong and staying on track as we look to lead the world hand in hand with our partners in the exploration of the moon and beyond. And that's about the nicest that anybody got. Rich McCormick, Republican from Georgia, had this to say, quote, it's no secret that China has a goal to surpass the United States by 2045 as global leaders in space. We can't allow this to happen. He also said, I think the leading edge that we have in space technology will protect the United States, not just the economy, but technologies that can benefit humankind. Bill Posey, a Republican from Florida, referred to space as the ultimate high ground and said that whoever leads in the final frontier will control the destiny of this earth. Also testifying about Artemis's ballooning costs were William Russell, Director of Contracting and National Security Acquisitions at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, and also George Scott, the agency's Acting Inspector General. They discussed the challenges of going forward with the Artemis program, and one of the biggest problems, well there were two actually, was an ambitious launch schedule, but more significantly a lack of transparency about the plan time timeline and the price tag. Quote, NASA has not developed a comprehensive estimate for all Artemis costs. Without the agency fully accounting for and accurately reporting the overall cost of current and future missions, it will be difficult for Congress to make informed decisions about NASA's long-term funding needs. Currently, NASA estimates that Artemis is going to cost the agency about $93 billion, although admittedly this includes expenditures all the way back to 2012 for the development of SLS, so a fair amount of that money has already been spent. Now, Catherine Kerner, Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, she had some positive things to say, predictably, because she still works for NASA right now and is optimistic about these planned dates. Quote, We believe that, and our administrator spoke about it just last week, that we would be on the surface of the moon before China is, and it's our intent for that to happen. But as we've just seen, previous administrator Mike Griffin does not share this optimism, and he had more to say, quote, In my judgment, the Artemis program is excessively complex, unrealistically priced, compromises crew safety, poses a high mission risk of completion, and is highly unlikely to be completed in a timely manner, even if successful. For the United States and its partners not to be on the moon when others are on the moon is unacceptable. We need a program that is consistent with that theme. Artemis is not that program. We need to restart it, not keep it on track. But who's right about all of this? Is Griffin just a bitter ex-administrator who didn't get an opportunity to go to the moon himself when the Constellation plan was canceled in the early 2000s? Or is he being realistic here? Well, I think a lot of you can guess that I'm going to conclude that he is being realistic and let me cover everything that he said and justify every point. For one thing, is it excessively complex? Indeed it is. Much, much more complex than Apollo ever was. First of all, it involves a space station in lunar orbit. Apollo obviously didn't have that. This space station isn't even going to exist when Artemis 3 lands astronauts on the moon. At least that's not the current plan. But once the halo, power and propulsion element, and IHAB modules are deployed after Artemis 3, the current mission architecture involves SLS sending Orion all the way out to the Gateway. It docks with Gateway and then Lunar Starship, not this tiny little human landing system that was originally imagined a couple of years ago, 
lunar starship then docks with the Gateway and takes the astronauts down to the lunar surface, then brings them back to the Gateway, and Orion takes them back to Earth. Now, even though I personally believe that the Gateway is going to prove to be an incredibly important part of establishing a permanent presence on the lunar surface, and we should get this station into operation as soon as possible, it is more complicated than Apollo, and it's more complicated than what China intends to do as well. China's current plan for putting astronauts on the moon by 2030 involves using the Long March 10, a new emerging super heavy rocket that will first deploy a lander and then send the Taikonauts out to lunar orbit where they will dock with the lander. The lander then sets down on the lunar surface. They explore the moon for a while and then go back to the crew capsule and return home. Now, admittedly, this is a wasteful way of getting to the moon. However, China doesn't intend to keep doing it this way forever, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's talk about the other time-consuming and complicated aspects of Artemis that are going to make it very difficult to hit any kind of launch dates in the near future. I've talked about this many times before, and it's Lunar Starship. If the Chinese method is expendable, wasteful, and simple, well, Starship is reusable and insanely complicated. By SpaceX's own admission, we're talking 10 launches of the biggest rocket in human history just to get two people to the surface of the moon. So you have to launch SLS, you have to have it dock with Lunar Starship in lunar orbit, and in order to get Starship there, you need to have 10 10 refueling launches or nine refueling launches and one launch of Lunar Starship depending on how this architecture actually works and I'm not sure if SpaceX even really knows how it works at this point so a total of 11 launches of super rockets just to get two people to the surface of the moon. That is insanely complicated and inefficient. In the long run, if we're talking about delivering huge numbers of people and lots of payload to the moon, then the system becomes a lot more efficient, especially once you have a refueling architecture built in low Earth orbit that's being resupplied by, say, asteroid mining or mining on the moon that will be able to send propellant and oxidizer to the these refueling depots far more easily because they don't have to overcome Earth's gravity to get there. However, all of those things are in the distant future. If we want to beat China to the moon by 2030, this is not really the way to do it. Now, what about unrealistically priced? Well, I've discussed the incredibly high costs of SLS many times on this channel, and with Boeing continuing to run the SLS development program, the cost of Artemis is going to utterly skyrocket as time goes on. However, I don't think it's the only aspect of this program that's likely to increase price-wise. Even though SpaceX signed a fixed-price contract with NASA... Unless SpaceX masters the concept of reusability very, very quickly, they are likely to lose a lot of boosters during the early stages of this program. The more boosters that SpaceX loses, 33 engines per booster, the more expensive this thing is going to become for SpaceX, and Elon can only absorb so much cost. Now, in a fixed-price contract, they theoretically don't have the flexibility to ask NASA for more money money, but that's not how this is really going to work. If we are trying to get back to the moon, trying to hit some sort of projected date, and SpaceX is the only way to do it, NASA's going to give them whatever money they ask for in order to get the job done. And it just is going to have to work that way if the cost of developing Starship turns out to be substantially more money than Elon anticipated. He can only absorb so much cost, as I said before. So there are many things about Artemis that's going to be make it very unrealistically priced and probably is going to have a skyrocketing price tag as time goes on, again, making it more likely that Congress is going to shut the whole thing down. 
What about compromises crew safety? Well, that unfortunately has problems that can be attached to SpaceX's solution also. Starship has no abort system during descent. We don't have to worry about abort systems during ascent because they're going to be using Orion, which has a good abort system, at least it seems to. However, during the descent, Starship cannot abort a landing. If anything goes wrong with the landing process and they can't make a safe landing on the lunar surface because of some sort of technical failure, navigation failure, something like that, the only thing the astronauts are going to be able to do is wait for gravity to end their lives. That's in sharp contrast to Apollo, which was able to abort a landing by using the ascent module to eject in case there was some sort of problem during the descent. That's something that Apollo never had to do, but nevertheless, that's something that was there for crew safety and is not going to be there with Artemis. And incidentally, as far as Blue Moon is concerned, I don't think that thing has an abort system either. If you'll note, the crew cabin is beneath the propellant and oxidizer tanks. I don't see how you can abort a landing with that thing because there's no ascent element to fall back on. Instead, if anything goes wrong with the blue moon descent, pretty sure that's going to be curtains for those astronauts as well. So yeah, as far as safety is concerned, Artemis has some significant weaknesses compared to Apollo. So what do we do about all this? Just cancel Artemis? Drop back and punt? Start all over again? Well, no. If we do that, there's no chance whatsoever of making it to the moon before 2030. Instead, there are a couple of critical components of the Artemis mission that could be modified that could really ensure success in the long run. Number one, Artemis 3 needs to change. There is zero chance of getting astronauts to the lunar surface by September of 2026. However, there is a chance of getting Lunar Gateway in operation by 2026. Now, I'm not saying that Lunar Gateway is going to make things simpler or easier. It actually adds a fair amount of complexity, but once you have Lunar Gateway in orbit, and once you have astronauts on Lunar Gateway orbiting the moon, it's going to be a lot more difficult for Congress to make the decision to cancel this thing, and also you're going to be able to show a lot of tangible progress. Sure, we don't have boots on the moon, but we have astronauts orbiting the moon for weeks or perhaps even months at a time. That's a capability that China will not have, especially in the early stages of their missions. Now, the other change that needs to be implemented is to bring back a simpler landing system as an alternative, as a backup. Congress needs to approve at least a couple billion dollars, perhaps a little bit more, to get Alpaca back on the books. Because Alpaca only requires two launches, not 10 or 11. Alpaca has an abort system. Alpaca is an appropriately sized vehicle to put two astronauts on the moon, and Alpaca is already well on its way to being a completed landing system. It passed its preliminary design review way back in 2020. Dynetics is ready to keep developing this thing. Of course, they would have to hire some people back. But nevertheless, this would be an ideal way to mirror the Chinese plan. Hell, they copy everything we do. We might as well copy something they do every now and then. In which case, you would have two launches to get two people on the surface of the moon at first and then just use that system until Starship and Blue Moon become operable systems and then let them take over when it's time for them to take over. Right now, I think it's just not far enough in the development of either vehicle, especially Blue Moon, to take on this challenge. And if we want Congress to continue to fund a new moon mission, if we truly want to return to the moon to stay, beating China to the moon is going to be an absolute essential. And in my opinion, this is the only way to reliably do it. 
Thank you very much for watching. Please like and please subscribe. And I would like to thank Colin Harvey and Chris Elvidge for becoming new Patreon members recently. If you would like to join them and help this content keep coming to you, well, all the details are in the description. In the meantime, stay angry about space.